is the Aldwych London. And this is the Aldwych Theatre, the London home of one of the most famous theatre organisations in the world, the Royal Shakespeare Company, and the setting for its version of Nicholas Nickleby by Charles Dickens. Good evening, I'm Peter Ustinov, your host for the Mobile Showcase Network presentation of The Life and Adventures of Nicholas Nickleby, which Charles Dickens began to write on the 7th of February, 1838, his 26th birthday, and which was published in monthly installments over the following year and a half. And as befits a novel which was conceived as a kind of serial, we are presenting the Royal Shakespeare Company's mammoth version of it in four parts. And so, unlike most adaptations of Dickens' novels, this will show you not just the highlights of the story, but virtually the whole of it. During the next four evenings, then, you will be meeting 39 actors who will, between them, introduce the full range of characters of a great Dickens novel, the kind of array for which the word teeming was invented. You'll meet baronets and beggars, moneylenders and milliners, aristocrats and outcasts. And at the centre of it all, you'll get to know a peculiarly English type of hero. For at the same time as the myth of the great American hero was being forged, the myth of the loner, the nonconformist, the mysterious figure forever riding into the nearest sunset, Charles Dickens chose as his central character a very different, though no less heroic young man, frightfully decent and well-meaning, painfully naive and terrible with women. Young Nicholas is almost tortuously slow on the uptake, but when finally raised to anger, his sense of outrage at injustice can be fearful to behold. But all that's in the future. For the moment, Nicholas is a young man of 19, born and bred in the country, and about to be thrown into the bustling, thrusting world of early Victorian London. And now to the actors and actresses of the Royal Shakespeare Company are out among the audience, welcoming them to the show. Let's join them. Well, it's almost true. In the 18th and early 19th centuries, the endings of Shakespeare's tragedies were rewritten by actor-managers eager for optimism. And we hope you'll forgive us for assuming that the Crummel's Theatre Company's production of Romeo and Juliet, referred to only briefly in Dickens' text, might have ended with such a miraculous collective resurrection. But certainly Dickens himself would have relished the irony. There were a number of pirated stage adaptations of Nickleby, many presented well before Dickens had completed the last chapters of the novel, and all of which imposed absurdly improbable happy endings on Dickens' unfinished story. And so, let us leave Nicholas happy and triumphant. Much is to come, but now, this is Peter Eustonoff, hoping you'll be with us for the third part of Nicholas Nickleby. Thank you. Good night. Good evening. I'm Peter Eustonoff, welcoming you back to the Mobile Showcase Network presentation of the life and adventures of Nicholas Nickleby, the remarkable Royal Shakespeare Company production, which has been adapted in four parts for television. In fact, rehearsals for this production began not with a completed script, but with just this Charles Dickens' 850-page novel. And for several weeks, before anybody knew what part they were going to play, they discussed this work. And one of the first things they discovered was that it is a book about money. The making of it, the losing of it, the loving of it, and the hating of it. Like ourselves, Dickens lived in a time of great technological change. The age of the steam engine, the discovery of the telegraph, Charles Darwin's voyage of exploration on the Beagle. An age in which developing technology was dragging thousands to the growing cities and in which the old social hierarchies and worn-out snobberies were breaking down. 
And at last, it seemed to Dickens, that men and women could be judged by their character and not only by their birth. But there was a darker side to this new democracy. If there were no longer any prescribed rules for human relationships, then the alternative seemed to be that people would relate only through money, through cash transactions that appeared to poison friendships and to corrupt and taint the kindnesses of earlier times. Dickens' own father, a cheerful but feckless man, had been imprisoned for debt, and young Charles had had to be sent out to work in a blacking factory, two experiences which were to haunt him all his life. And in this episode of Nicholas Nickleby, Nicholas and his sister Kate continue to confront these two kinds of evil. On the one hand, aristocrats who expect to have their desires gratified by virtue of their station, and financiers like their uncle Ralph, who see no reason why the ties of birth and family should interfere with their obsessive lust for gold. Well, there we are. For a moment it seemed as though Nicholas, his family, and Smike had achieved that happiness which they deserve. Well, at all events, whatever happens now, Nicholas has discovered in the amazing characters of the brothers Cheerable that not everyone in London is corrupted by the touch of money, even if he, and indeed we, may be allowed a doubt as to whether such extraordinary philanthropists could really exist at any period of history. But it's part of Dickens' genius, not just to show us things and people as they are, but to show us what they could be, or even more, to demonstrate what ought to be, and what we could, perhaps, strive harder to achieve. Thank you for watching. Please join us for the final part of Nicholas Nickleby. This is Peter Eustonoff wishing you good night. Good evening. This is Peter Eustonoff welcoming you to the final part of the Mobile Showcase Network presentation of the life and adventures of Nicholas Nickleby and inviting you to meet two of the performers from the Royal Shakespeare Company's production of Dickens' great novel. Roger Rees, who plays Nicholas, and Emily Richard, who plays his sister, Kate. Let me ask you, Emily, first of all, uh, what are the challenges of playing a Victorian heroine? Well, well, there are problems, of course, but I think there are many problems because it's quite difficult to play a good person. But when I first read the book, I, I terribly wanted to play Kate, and I thought that everybody, every other young actress in the company would want to play her too, but uh, fortunately they didn't. <laughs> 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 we're very lucky, you see, because we're able to talk in our production with um, the voice both of uh, the characters uh, and also the reported speech and uh, observance of Charles Dickens himself, which of course is so exciting. We can. Um, uh, you know, we can point out when the character's prim by turning to the camera, and uh, we can point out when they're being rather priggish and things yes. like that, so we're very yes. lucky. And I think uh, you, you do have to remember that Nicholas and Kate are very, they're very young. Kate is not yet 20, and they've lived all no, their life... No, it's Nicholas, he's no, not yet 20. No, now. I know. Yeah, it's very important. And they've lived all their life down in Devon, quite sheltered, and suddenly, and not very good circumstances, they're thrown into London, into cynics and the hypocrites, libertines, and, um... I think they cope remarkably well, don't you? Defending their honour and standing up for what they think is right and true. Well, I think uh, you both do it absolutely remarkably. I'm frightfully jealous of everything that you do in this production. It's very good, and one must not forget either that even if the two of you uh, were not yet 20, Dickens himself was only 26. That's right. And uh, he did have this kind of militant compassion uh, in him. Well. Now it's time to see the climax of the whole story, and in a way, the resolution of the conflict between two very different views of the world and of human nature. On the one hand, Ralph Nickleby's view that the only real motivation for human behavior is self-interest, all the rest looks after itself, and on the other, the belief symbolized by Nicholas and Smike that people are often much more selfless and more moral than we think they are and almost always better than the world around them lets them be. Well, there it is. Good has at last triumphed over evil. 
everyone is safe, and our villains are all chewing on their just desserts, in prison or even for the greatest malefactors in Australia. But there's a kind of ambiguity as well. We ask ourselves, and I think we're meant to, whether it's really possible for the world to stop, for the lives of Nicholas, his wife and family, to freeze into an endless and unchanging happy ending, Christmas every day. And the truth, of course, lies with that poor outcast in the snow, that for every smike you rescue, there are thousands more still out there. And while it's important to aspire towards a world where people can be kind, the way to bring that closer is to realize how very far we have to go. This is Peter Ustinov, your host for Mobile Showcase Network's presentation of Charles Dickens' Nicholas Nickleby. Thanking you for watching and wishing you, in the words of Mr. Vincent Crummles and his company, the warmest of farewells.